gliders were not new. As early as 1932, the German scientist Oppel fixed solid fuel rockets to this small glider to achieve tentative rocket-powered flight. By 1941, the idea had been developed into the Messerschmitt 163. This diminutive delta-winged fighter was designed by Dr. Lippisch and powered by an incredibly efficient liquid-fueled rocket. The prototype, flown by Heine Dittmar, took off from Karlshagen at Pienemünde in 1941. On becoming airborne, the undercarriage was jettisoned and the aircraft demonstrated an amazing rate of climb. Later, Dietmar was towed to altitude to conserve fuel when he achieved 623 miles per hour, easily breaking the existing world speed record though naturally this was not claimed due to wartime security. During that record-breaking flight, Heine Dittmar probed the edges of what was later to be called the sound barrier. Heine Dittmar was not the only test pilot to fly the 163. Hannah Reich also test flew one of the early models from the Messerschmitt airfield at Lechfeld, and she later flew a more powerful version, now named Comet, which made a great impression on her. And I can only tell you, it was fascinating. It was like thundering through the skies, sitting on a canoe ball, like being intoxicated by speed. It was not difficult to uh, fly it. It was only an overwhelming impression. At the end of the airfield, of the airfield boundary, you already reached about 500 miles per hour, and with constant speed you were climbing up in one and a half to two minutes into a height of 30,000 feet. Exhilarating though it undoubtedly was, after six minutes the comet's rocket fuel was exhausted and the world's fastest fighter became the world's fastest glider which called for extremely accurate flying. Fuel used by the comet consisted of Seestoff and Tiestoff. They were basically methanol alcohol and hydrogen peroxide, which are highly incompatible. A few drops of one on the other produced a violent reaction. Tischdorf was capable of spontaneous combustion when in contact with any organic material. which, of course, included the pilot. In view of the nature of the fuel, Hannah Reich, like all Comet pilots, had special protective clothing. But despite this protection, some pilots were dissolved alive by the murderous fuel. Hannah Reich well remembers the dangers of test flying the Messerschmitt comets. I experienced two comrades blowing to pieces when their plane exploded. On one of Hannah Reich's test flights, as she was towed into the air, the undercarriage refused to jettison. I couldn't get rid of it. At the same time, this often happens when you have an accident that many things at the same time go out of work. So all electrical operating instruments were kaput. Um, also the landing flaps and so many and also the radio connection with the tow pilot and with the ground so it was difficult to uh, let the tow pilot know that I wanted to come into a great height so for 10 minutes he circled uh, in a height of about um, uh, nine, uh, 900 feet um, but I stubbornly remained on the rope and suddenly, and I only watched when, they, uh, when the ambulance and the stretcher and the fire truck and all uh, came to receive me. And I thought, and said, oh, I hope I will come quite safely down. But suddenly, uh, the tow pilot went up to uh, 9,000 feet and I released the cable and 
I tried with positive and negative G's to get rid of the undercarriage, but I felt that it, I didn't succeed. But I hope to bring this um, test plane to the ground safely because such a test uh, plane has many, many uh, valuable instruments. And, um, but because all electrical operating instrument didn't work, uh, also not the landing flaps, um, the last side slip, I had to come to approach the airfield in a greater height as normally in order to be sure that you will reach the place and you had then to lose high with the cautious side slip but this destroyed the whole airflow because it was only wing without tail plane it came out of control and crashed in the field it was completely demolished in my head uh, came to an instrument and i suffered uh, my nose was i have an artificial nose and it's quadruple of fractured head and, and vertebra broken and many things. So after having been five months hospitalized, I was well again spurned on by the only burning wish to continue as test pilot again. For multiple injuries, Hannah Reich flew to Pinamunda, but she had chosen a most unfortunate date. When I arrived there just after having been recovered after my my uh, accident with the rocket plane I just arrived when in the first night was the horrible bombardment in Pinemunde. It was the first RAF raid on the secret establishment causing considerable damage to the V2 rockets and the living quarters of the scientists but once again Hannah Reicher's amazing luck had helped I'm terribly ashamed that I must say I slept the whole night. They forgot I slept in the house where the, you see, there was Peniminde West and Peniminde East. In one was the development of Werner von Braun's V2, and on the West we made, we wanted to make the V1 um, and um, the rocket flights and other things were done there. But I uh, had my quarter in the, in the house where the officers slept at, when there was the siren, I didn't hear it. I slept so deeply and everybody thought, oh, the others had fetched Hannah. So I was quite alone in this house, sleeping deeply. I didn't hear anything about her. And the next morning, I was so ashamed when suddenly someone, I thought, oh, it's misty, but it was only smoke about all what was burning. And you see, the main attack was east and I was in the west, it was some not so near. Throughout the war, Hannah Reich remained a civilian, but she was personally awarded two iron crosses by Adolf Hitler. What were her impressions of the German leader? I can't judge how it was with Hitler in all other areas. I only can judge that in what he was interested about my doing and test flights, I was deeply astonished about his questions and his interest. 